This is, shall we say, no film university of the air. The program does not dwell on shot analysis or any other kind of analysis. It is a sitcom with its own noodling toodling theme song, starring two guys who live in a movie theater and argue all the time. CinemaSins is every kind of internet and no kind of film criticism. It's as tightly structured as a movie star's promotional visit to a talk show, the requisite clip, the desultory chat. It shows you a couple of minutes from several new films so you can decide if you want to see them, or even better, talk about them at parties without bothering to see them. For moviegoers in a hurry, this is Master Plots Theater. The format, to be sure, was not designed to offer extended, enlightened commentary on pictures. It means mainly to answer two consumer questions about every movie. What's it like? Will I like it? A minute or two or twenty of discussion, which mounts to fewer words on the subject than an article, and break for an ad read. Cinem Sins is what it is, and it is successful enough for each of its channels to earn, it is said, an annual million or so dollars from the gig. Whatever the gripes against their show, Cinem Sins do a tough job professionally. They give you movie clips and sound bites. They seem at ease and in charge on the online screen. No small feat, as I can attest, and I've got the videotapes to prove it. They have triumphantly marketed online size versions of themselves. They are the very best possible cinema sins. More money to them. This is a quote from an article about the death of film criticism. It was written in 2020 about cinema sins. Except it wasn't. It was written in 1990 about Roger Ebert. I just swapped around a few of the words. To understand why that is significant, we first have to understand just how influential Roger Ebert was, and why it might be a horrifying sin to compare himself and the YouTube channel known as CinemaSins. Roger Ebert is pretty much the only film critic that many people can name. Even if you can't name him, I'm willing to bet you're familiar with at least some of his work, or rather, his thumbs. He was the first critic to receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and even after his death in 2013, his site is self-proclaimed as the preeminent destination for movie criticism, commentary, and community. CinemaSins, on the other thumb, has been deemed lazy AF, blatantly ignorant, and seriously pathological, disruptive, and childish. And that's just from commenters less than a day ago on one of their newest videos. CinemaSins has also been slammed by filmmakers such as Ryan Johnson, Jordan Vogt Roberts, and Damon Lindelof, and lauded by auteurs Kevin Smith and Dane Cook. What do CinemaSins do that evokes such reaction? The basic premise of their channel is the Everything Wrong With series where they find errors and goofs in popular films. Their negative outlook on films has been derided in several lengthy videos on YouTube and has spawned whole channels who critique their content and propose its antithesis. Despite all this, their channel is still one of film's biggest, amassing nearly 10 million subscribers and over 3.5 billion views. Suffice it to say that this is at least one similarity between Ebert and CinemaSins. Capital. Now, I don't just mean economic capital, though to be sure both parties have done extremely well for themselves, I'm sure. No, there are other types of capital to be considered here, cultural to be exact. Prominent film critics like CinemaSins or Roger Ebert and really every person who talks about films in a public space have amassed what Pierre Bourdieu would call cultural capital. This is something that makes every celebrity or notable person, well, notable. They have accrued an audience that, for whatever reason, appreciates their opinion or perspective or whatever it may be. Now, of course, most people would not mention CinemaSins and Roger Ebert in the same breath, so we must first analyze what ungodly kind of capital CinemaSins have acquired for me to do this. For one, they are extremely popular, one of, if not the most popular, channel discussing movies on YouTube. Eliana Radu proposes a new form of cultural capital, digital capital. Interestingly, despite his passing, it could be argued that Ebert has continued to gain this capital as his persona is continually used online. There is even an account on the movie social media letterboxed with nearly 10,000 followers, which is a decent amount on a social media platform with only 3 million users as of 2021, compared to comparables with tens of millions more. Letterboxd throws another interesting wrinkle into the development of film criticism with the digitization of culture. One of the most common tenets of traditional critics mourning the death of their profession is that of how democratizing the internet has been for the opinions of just about anyone. And it's true, with the rise of the internet, essentially anyone can become a critic. Some have welcomed this, including, obviously, Roger Ebert. Hal Gazabo asserts that criticism starts as soon as we come out of the movies and discuss with our friends what we have just seen, and this is unlikely to ever change. Though if you asked a Letterboxd user like myself, the first thing we do is think about what star rating and what quirky review we can give to the movie we just watched. And on a site like Letterboxd, our quirky one-liner has as much chance of blowing up as a poignant essay. As Callum Marsh of the New York Times puts it, what rises to the top of the site's page for the most popular reviews ranges wildly. There are obscure memes, diaristic essays, and sprawling screeds packed with pseudo-academic jargon. Letterboxd essentially encapsulates what the wider internet has become. It's like if your movie buff cousin had his own show right after Siskel and Ebert at the movies. Highbrow, middlebrow, and lowbrow culture comes together, 
on the same platforms, on the same spaces. Maybe a snobby film critic will laugh at this happened to my buddy Eric on Joker. Maybe a superhero stan will learn about how anti-colonial Wonder Woman can be read as. Maybe someone who exclusively watches Adam Sandler will discover Uncut Gems or Punch Drunk Love and realize that they actually like serious movies. If I were to compare this phenomenon to an appropriately middle-brow show whose fans often have a bit of a superiority complex, it's like the episode of Community where Pierce tries to fit in with Abed, Troy, and Chang, who watch movies to make fun of them. And then things change. Change? Time to change the channel. This guy's gonna be begging for change if he keeps making movies this bad. <laughs> they should change this movie to something good. This movie stinks. We better change his sniper. <laughs> That's change we can believe in. Okay, obviously something strange is happening here. What do you mean? I'm making jokes during the movie. Yeah, but you're doing it with the speed and determination of the incomparable Robin Williams. Yeah. It's evident in the course of the episode that Pierce does not really want to be a nice person to watch movies with. He is actively after cultural capital, as he so often is during the show, with the established authority. That is, young, hip, and cool people. Each of these characters coming together in the same space to talk about media is a representation of how sites like Letterboxd and even the film community of YouTube have sort of provided a level playing field for all film critic hopefuls, if they want to be deemed as such. Troy arguably comes into the show with the most cultural capital, and he is the main person Pierce attempts to impress, at least tied with Jeff at the beginning of the show. He represents the existing hegemony of film criticism, the cool club, where if you get it, you get it. Abed is the fanboy. He shits on the Kick Puncher franchise, but we know that he truly loves it. Abed can represent the CinemaSins or the Honest Trailers or the quirky Letterboxd reviewers. He is in. He knows film culture and he loves it. The master of all ciphers and codes that come with it. But he appreciates the value of the new age. He is likely what most of us internet age critics would be, including the people behind CinemaSins. Though on the surface, CinemaSins is more like Pierce. People that don't watch film for the fun of it, just so they can be up on cultural capital. And to an extent, that is what the CinemaSins channel is about, or at least what it is mocking. Wouldn't you rather just watch a movie with your friends and have a good time? What are you, my third wife therapist? But neither do the people behind the nitpicking character consider themselves critics or hate movies this much. It is what the people want, evidently. They have a longer form podcast where they mostly praise their favorite movies and give recommendations, even for movies that they have sinned. Ebert responded to Corliss in the very next film comment issue. In response to Corliss's criticism that Siskel and Ebert is not in-depth criticism, he says, I wish we had more time on the program. It would be fun to do an open-ended show with a bunch of people sitting around talking about movies, but we would have to do it for our own amusement, because nobody would play it on television. I am almost certain that Ebert would have the leeway to start such a podcast today. Likewise, the fact that Twitter users, Rotten Tomatoes scores, and yes, even CinemaSins, are being referenced in the world of film academia is a sign that the lines are being blurred, much to the fright of traditional film critics. And yet, existing power structures might still be kicking around. YouTuber and filmmaker Chris Stuckman says he has to work harder than traditional print critics to be taken seriously or noticed. Matthias Frey and his book, Film Criticism in the Digital Age, agree and say that, Although some democratization is achieved in terms of access and broader participation in critical discourse, in crucial ways, sites such as Rotten Tomatoes in fact venerate traditional criticism and its gatekeeping hierarchies. Rotten Tomatoes' declaration of people as top critics is a carbon copy of the old nobility system of criticism, and as more and more critics adopt Twitter accounts or letterboxed accounts, people will undoubtedly look to them as opposed to average Joe simply because of the title. Even on Letterboxd, there is a bit of a caste system, as users can pay to be either a pro or a patron, reinforcing the idea that to be at least a little more legitimate as a critic on Letterboxd, you must have at least a little bit of economic capital already, at least enough to comfortably pay for a subscription. CinemaSins is not criticism, at least according to the folks behind it. However, the landscape of criticism is changing, as it always does. There will be serious critics, there will be half-serious critics, and there will be jokesters who are nonetheless looked to for their opinions simply because of how funny they are. CinemaSins has been referenced in academic articles. Lucy May of Letterboxd fame considers herself a Letterboxd-era critic, despite the fact that most of her witty reviews are less than 250 words. Significantly, the one thing that will likely never ever change is Anton Ego's assertion that But in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it so. In a survey conducted by Rotten Tomatoes with Rotten Tomatoes users, when asked, where do you get your movie recommendations, 40% said either aggregators, video reviews, social media, and web print publications. Those are the numbers combined for all of those categories. The remaining 60% settled on one option, family and friends. And I think that source will stick around for a while.